So, these wankers at Elderwood Games, they um, claim they don't want a monopoly, yet that's what they submitted to the USPTO, a monopoly. <laughs> I, I find this the most fascinating, that they claim to not be trying to get a monopoly, yet if you look at what they have... Oops. So, this is what Elderwood owns. If I'd copied this, I'd understand them being mad. But this, which has design, which has aesthetics, which has distinctiveness, is not what they submitted to the USPTO. This is what they submitted to the USPTO. They literally submitted a <laughs> line drawing <laughs> of a hexagonal box with seven hexagons inside. Because mind you, none of these design aspects are what they're disputing in my design. What they're disputing is this here, the arrangement of seven hexagons in a tessellation, which literally existed billions of years before life existed on this planet. There are crystals that form hexagonal tessellations like this because it's pure function. So I'm going to show you and then, well, why, why, by the way, why would they take something that has lots of design and aesthetic cues, that has lots of distinctiveness, because that is distinctive and aesthetic, and why would they erase everything aesthetic or distinctive about their box? They literally took their beautiful, well-designed, aesthetic, very distinctive dice box, and they stripped it of everything that had any kind of design or aesthetic value and submitted a seven hexagon tessellation to the USPTO, which by the way is illegal. This is, violates every rule the USPTO has. I guess it's not illegal, it's against the rules. Um, it vi oh, it's fraud, so that would be illegal. <laughs> it, it violates every rule because this is not a trade dress. They don't use this anywhere. It's not on their business cards. It's not in their products. It's not on their labels, it's not on their letterheads, it's not on their websites, it's not in their advertisements. They don't use this anywhere. This is literally the most basic engineering line drawing of a seven hex tessellation they can come up with, stripped of all design and aesthetic cues. The only reason you do that is because you want a patent. <laughs> And you can't get a patent. So you paid someone off at the USPTO or their USPTO doesn't care enough to bother looking and says, this patent line drawing of a hexagonal box, okay, we'll accept that as trade dress, even though they don't use it as trade dress anywhere. What they do use as trade dress is that bird logo. <laughs> that would be valid trade dress. <laughs> but okay. So um, I want to show what I designed probably about 30 years ago, maybe like me, 28 years ago, it, I actually found the floppy drives that have my files on it from AutoCAD. I took drafting class in, in high school and junior high school, and I designed a lot of stuff in AutoCAD, lots of model airplanes, space station houses, stuff like that. And I have an entire floppy disk called Hex. And it's, you know, Hex, you know, house, Hex boat, Hex airplane, Hex space station, Hex box. You know, all my, I got into a hex phase and I designed a whole bunch of hex of stuff. I couldn't actually manufacture any of these things. I didn't have the skills. So I dumbed it down as simple as I could to make a hex box. My original hex box that I made in somewhere in the early 90s, it, was, it would be before 1994. So it'd be 1991 to 1994, was a simple slip fit. Kind of like this. How, how this slides inside of this. Like a, like a jewelry box, literally. So the bottom half was literally a hexagon with seven hex spaces inside. That was a bitch, mind you. I had to make straight pieces and then cut them so that the pieces would intersect like this, you know, so that I can make the, the drawers. And um, I didn't have the skill to make that very nice. So it tended to be, um, you know, test fit, file it, test fit, file it, test fit, file it until it fit. And, um... Then the, the lid was literally just a slip fit. It was just a, a one single empty hexagon and it just friction fit right over top of the other half. And I created a hex box. I actually didn't even originally create it for Dungeons and Dragons and Dice. I was just on a hex fit. And I was making hexagon everything in AutoCAD. And some of these things I could make and some of them I couldn't. 
And uh, like obviously I couldn't make the hexagon space station. <laughs> um, but um, the box I could make in woodshop, and I did. Um, someone said, "Hey, that looks like the you know so and so's dice." But I don't even remember. They just apparently they had seen something like it before and said, "Hey, can you make it smaller so I could put?" Because my original box is about this big, and um. I think I originally put like Hot Wheels cars in it or something like that, or Pogs, or I don't even know what I put in it. It was it was bigger than it was about this big. It was about twelve inches across, and um, because um, I just made a chessboard with my dad's saddle, by the way. <laughs> so I made a hexagon box. I was originally going to try to make a hexagon chessboard, but that was way beyond my skill set. So I um, I settled on a hexagon box, and one of my classmates said. Well, we make one smaller, you know, we can use it for dice when we play Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, well, that's a good idea. So I made a smaller one. I was actually making them out of paper, too. And paper was a lot easier for me to work with. <laughs> you just layer it, fold it, glue it, and, you know, paper holds up nice. Not for long term, though. None of those survived. I doubt I even have the original boxes I made. I mean, I think the only thing I have from the 90s, I have parts of one of my gliders. And um, I just managed to hang on to a few pieces of it. Just nostalgia. And I still have the chessboard. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that made the move with me from Pennsylvania to New Mexico. But obviously I left the vast majority of my stuff behind. I mean it would it would have taken ten school buses to bring everything here. And where would I put it? <laughs> um, so we're gonna make that original chess box, that original um, hex box here in Tinkercad. And I'm going to show you how stupid, easy, and simple, and purely functional it is. So, you take a hexagon, and everything is going to be based off this original hexagon. So, the, the way this works is it's called a tessellation. We're going to make this 10 tall. And the reason you use a tessellation um, is because it's the most efficient packing. So there is no more efficient way to pack a geometric shape than a tessellation. That's where you fit face to face. Okay, you can have a, a, a you know, you open up your crayon box and it's got little square holes. That's a square tessellation. You have something gyroid infill, not gyroid, um, triangle infill on your three D printer. That's a tessellation. Well, a hexagon has a tessellation. It's actually an industry standard. It's, uh, what's it called? Um, HDC or um, um, HD. HP high density hexagon packaging or something like that. It's an industry standard. And it's also, I, I find it cute that they keep using this when they describe it. Um, because it's like, I just wanna I just wanna bitch slap Elderwood across the face every time they say it. And eventually their lawyer's gonna go, Why the fuck do you keep slapping me? I was like, because eventually you're gonna get it. You know, and I slap them at the right point and they go, You keep slapping me when I say honeycomb. No shit. <laughs> you didn't design the honeycomb, motherfuckers. <laughs> They keep saying it's their design, their aesthetic, and then they call it the very thing they can't have designed. A honeycomb! <laughs> it's not theirs! <laughs> so, <laughs> um, this is going to be pretty crude. Tinkercad doesn't allow you to do um, um, the kind of um, thing that I want to do, so I'm going to show you here. So we take one, and we space them. Good, that did that automatically. And you know something, I bet you. Ooh, I know how to make this almost perfect in Tinkercad. <laughs> I just figured that out, nice. Um, my last one had all kinds of, um. You know, it, it looked nice when you looked at it, but when you printed it, you could tell that the they weren't even. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a designer, I'm not a catter, you know. I come up with ideas, but other people make them real for me. Um, so control D. Now, what is that? It's 60 degrees. So we want to rotate this 60 degrees. There we go. There is a 7 hex tessellation. Okay. That's all that is. It's just a 7 hexagon tessellation. There's nothing special or unique about this. It is purely functional. Any other arrangement of hexagons will take more space by definition. Okay, you can't fit them in here any other way that doesn't take um, more space. So we're also going to control D this so I can maintain a center point. 
and then we're going to highlight all of these. We are going to unselect one of these. We're going to group them, and we're going to turn them into a cut. And then for now, we are going to... Actually, I can make that... Uh, if I hide that temporarily, I can take this one, make it a little taller, unhide there. Now I can grab that center one when I need to. Because I need to keep them all aligned, otherwise things are going to get hokey really quick. Okay? So, I need to rotate this 30 degrees, I believe. Yes! And then... How do I keep it centered? I know how. I control D it, and I drop it down. So now I have this one to use as an anchor to center this one when I resize it. I'll show you why in a minute. Nope, that's not doing it. This, there we go. Almost. A little bit bigger. That looks good. So now I take that one and this one. I do the align tool. And then I select this one, which is going to anchor those parts together. So they don't shift and move on me relative to the other ones. See? So now I have an anchor for both sets of hexagons. So now I take this and I make it 22 and there it is it's inside there now i also need to duplicate this and i'm going to make this a little, we're going to just shift this down like this so it's out of the way and hide it we take this and this and we join them together now i have my seven hexagon tessellation inside the box okay now this is still my center point for this hexagon so that'll allow me to keep everything centered i undo my hide now this i have to make bigger so i have to make this a little bit bigger than the other one select that anchor this and this. Is that thick enough? Might be a hair too thick. Yeah, I think it's a hair too thick. We have to make spacing. Because um, you have to account for the tolerances of the 3D printer. That should do it. So this and this. Align, anchor, align, align, good. So now I can hide this. I can also hide this. We want to make this. Um, how big do we want to make it? I think it's 20 still. No, it's 22 now. Because we put a 2 millimeter floor on the bottom of it. Okay. Oop, this one is subsurface, so I first have to bring it to zero. And it is still 22 tall. Yes. So now I control D. I duplicate this again. Um, I stretch it out a little bit. Okay. Bring it down. We want to select this and this. Align. Anchor. Center, center. Now I'm going to take this and make a hole in it using this. So that's going to be a hole. And we're going to make this 21.8. Join. Oh, I forgot. I don't want to cut it all the way through. That's actually easy to fix. Instead, we will make this 20. There we go. Unhide. Get rid of our centerpiece that we don't need anymore. Rotate this. 
180 degrees. And there we go. Then lift this up two millimeters. Actually, no. Instead, I want to shorten this two millimeters. There. There you go. According to Elderwood, this violates their bullshit bogus trade dress. <laughs> okay. Let me change the color of these to make them a little more visible for you. So this is actually the original design that I made in, in school, except for one difference. See how this is filled in here? Um, those weren't filled in on mine. They, these were also hollow. This was all walls. There was no solid portions because I, I built each of these hexagons and fit them inside of the bigger hexagon. How would I describe that? Um, I could draw it. It would take too long to do it on here, but I can draw it easy enough. My original design. Uh, see, I didn't have the skill to try to make something like that out of wood. Um, you could try using a... Um, a scroll saw, you know, drill a hole through the wood, scroll saw through, cut out your hexagons, and then fit that with a lid. That could work. I took a slightly easier route. I, I built seven hexagons, and I just made those seven hexagons fit inside the first hexagon. And to put a lid on it, I literally glued the lid on it and then filed down the edges until it matched the bigger hexagon. And that was how I made both halves. So the, um, what I would do is I would, I would literally, for the paper ones, this is actually exactly what I did. The, the first prototype was actually paper. So I would do a three-fold like this, and then I would fold the three-fold in half like this. And that gave me my six spaces for the hexagon. I just had to reverse two of them. And there you go. You just made a paper hexagon. And then what I'd do is I would make seven of these hexagons. I'd glue them together. So I would literally have this shape in here without the outer wall. And then both halves of my hex box was this here, just an empty hexagon box. And then I would take this set of hexagons that I made and glued together and stick them inside the box. And that was it. That, that, that's, that's how simple it was to make a hexagon box. I mean, it wasn't as pretty, but it worked. You know, it was the, it was the smallest space you can consume and fit seven hexagons. Except, again, remember, my original one was 12 inches. <laughs> so, actually, this is probably, this might not be too far off of how big um, the original hexagons were. Although, I remember it being big enough to put a Hot Wheels car in. So, bigger than this. Because that, that, that's, that's the first thing I put in it was some Hot Wheel cars. Well, airplanes, actually, but Hot Wheels. There was a little um, die cast, um, you know, little, little metal airplanes. You get six of the pop. I don't even know if they still, still sell them. But you'd go to you'd go to you know the store and you'd get um a pack of five or six of them in a pack and there'd be five different jets and I was putting the jets inside these so it's quite probably about twice as big as this I keep losing you on the camera but that's literally all I did and then I did the same thing out of wood okay very thin veneer of wood and literally veneer is like um you ever see a formica top counter the wood was like that thin it was for putting a veneer on top. But the cool thing with wood like that is that um, uh, you could score it and bend it or even wet it and bend it. So once I knew how big I needed this piece to be, I would just make, you know, the, the five marks on the strip of wood, you know, use a straight edge and crease it, crease it, crease it until I formed a hexagon. I would make seven of those. I would glue those seven hexagons together. And then those, that seven hexagon arrangement would actually fit 
inside of how can I point to that? It would fit right there. It would fit inside that box right there. And that seven hex paper or wood would slip right in the box. The lid was the exact same box with nothing in it and slightly bigger so that it would slip fit over the first box. And that's literally all I did. <laughs> the, the reason the um, hex box looks so nice now is that now we have 3D modeling software, which means I can do stuff like that. I don't have to, you know, making a lid that where both sides had hexagons so it was half the height. See, the, the reason I like the 3D printed one is that it's half the height. Because both, it's taking this hexagon and slicing it in half. So one half of the hexagon is in the lid and one half of the hexagon is in the base. And that allows you to make each half shorter. And by making each half shorter, it's easier to grab the dice. You don't have to, my, my original box, you know, I had to flip the box over and dump the dice out. Right, now with the 3D printing, it was a lot easier to do. I can just um, make the each half of the box half the size. That's why the two halves of the box are symmetrical. Nothing like Elderwood's design, okay? For me, it was a functional choice. I wanted the two halves to be symmetrical because the half height meant you can pick the dice up out of the box instead of having to dump it over and dump the dice out. Just convenience. Um, but there you go. Simple dice box. And according to Elderwood, they own the rights to this. I literally, literally, let's see, how many were you? A 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I took 11 hexagons and made a box with 7 hexagons inside of it. A literal, natural 7 hexagon tessellation. And according to Elderwood, this violates their trade dress because instead of trade dressing this, because they don't want to protect this box, they want to have the exclusive right to make hexagon boxes for as great a limit as they can. So that's what they filed with the USPTO. <laughs> and no one at the USPTO... Actually... Someone at the USPTO did have a working brain because when they first filed this, it was rejected. They said, you have to have distinctiveness. Well, suing everybody or threatening to sue everybody so everybody stops publishing seven hexagon tessellations because I will be posting this to uh, Thingiverse tonight. <laughs> you know, suing everybody to prevent them from making this so that you're the only one in the market because you legally threatened everybody else out of the market, and this market is too small for people to risk going to court and fighting over. <laughs> Thank you, lawful masses, because without you, I wouldn't be able to do anything. What am I going to do? Risk going to court with no money over a goddamn hexagon box I give away for free? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, they're they're basically you know, they're throwing their legal dick around to bump people offline, and then they send out review units to a bunch of people with a um, carbon copy response for each person because if you read their distinctiveness proof it's a carbon copy form that they had these people sign for getting this free box <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> and that proves they've acquired distinctiveness Yes, they've acquired distinctiveness by threatening to sue everybody and giving away a bunch of free boxes with no competition around because they threatened to sue everybody. <laughs> this box has been around since longer than I've been alive. I mean, if you guys... The problem is this comes from an era where there's no proof. It comes from the 90s and earlier. Not only does it come from the 90s and earlier, but it comes from a nothing. It comes from Dungeons & Dragons. How many people play Dungeons and Dragons beside weirdo nerds like us? Okay? <laughs> I mean... So there's no... it's not, Nothing was digital yet, so it's not like I could just bring up the 90s on my computer and say, Oh yeah, there's the dice box I made. I mean, I got that floppy disk with the hex files on it, but that's not going to be readable. <laughs> it's a 30-year-old, five-and-a-quarter-inch floppy from, what was it, AutoCAD 11? <laughs> I mean, it just... 
this is what they're claiming they own. But we don't want a monopoly. But this is what they're claiming they own. But we don't want a monopoly. You're claiming a monopoly. You're saying anybody who makes a 7-hex tessellation is violating your fictional trade dress. You're trying to abuse the trade dress process to acquire patent protection. And that should really scare people. Because people say, well, wait a minute. Can't you just, you know, rotate or resize one of the hexagons so it's no longer a tessellation? And then you won't be violating their trade dress? Sure, I could do that. They'll get their trade dress. It'll be established. Once it's established, it's a hell of a lot harder to oppose. Because you got to put up real money to sue them to oppose it. Because they're not inclined to undo something that's been done. you got to get it before it's been done. If, if Elderwood hadn't jerked off and shut down my Thingiverse listing a second time before the 30-day window for opposition was up, they would have gotten it. Because who's going to go check on a dice box application from Elderwood Games? Who's going to check? <laughs> no one. All right? All they had to do was wait 30 days, and there would probably be nothing I could do about it. And so you say, well, just make the center hex bigger. Sure, I can make the center hex bigger. And let me tell you exactly what will happen. A year will go by, and then they'll send you a cease and desist letter saying, your product is too similar to our product, and it's going to cause dilution in the marketplace. And they'll be correct. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly why it's an invalid trademark. <laughs> this would literally, literally, you take the, um, um, what what are two cars that look alike? You got the, um, uh, you, you got the, uh, the, the Honda Fit, and you got the Mitsubishi Mirage. They're both small four-door hatchbacks okay so this would be like honda going to the trademark office and saying we're going to submit a trade dress application for this. You think I'm kidding? From this to this. from this to this there's no difference you can't have a patent on this it's a copyright issue you can't have a copyright it's a patent issue okay so they can't have a copyright because it's a functional design it's an object that's covered by patents, not copyright. Copyright would cover this logo here. Okay? Trade dress would cover this logo here. But what they want to do is stop anybody else from making hexagon dice boxes. Specifically, the seven hex tessellation. That's what they specifically want to stop people from making. They don't want people to be able to make seven hexagon tessellation hexagon boxes. Okay? So they took this and distilled it down to its most basic functional generic form this forget about this half they're not even disputing this half because my my dice box is this two times two it's that on both sides okay so double violation <laughs> okay um they literally distilled their aesthetic distinctive design and they stripped it of any distinctiveness they stripped of any aesthetics and they stripped it of any design and they boiled it down to literally eight hexagons a seven hexagon tessellation inside of a hexagon they literally boiled 
everything that was aesthetic, distinctive, and designed in their product, and they boiled it down to something that is not distinctive, that is not designed by them. They even themselves call it a fucking honeycomb. <laughs> <laughs> even they can't get past their own cognitive dissonance and they call it a honeycomb because they know it. they didn't design it this is not their design this is their design that's not their design just like <coughs> that's Honda's design that's not Honda's design that's Honda's design. But Honda's going to submit this to the USPTO for trade dress protection and then go after anybody who makes a four door, four wheel car with a hatchback. Just like Elderwood is going after anybody who makes seven hexagons inside of an eighth. <laughs> Not copying the Honda Fit. Violating that. This is this. That's what they did. That's not what trade dress is for. They already got denied copyright because it's a patent issue. Because remember, they're not trying to copyright their logo. The objective of Elderwood Games is monopoly. They want to own the right to use a seven hexagon tessellation inside of a hexagon. They want to own the right to those shapes. Eight hexagons. In the most efficient way you can pack them. Mathematically, that's that's not... A, they, they say, well, there's unlimited possibilities. No, there's one. There's only one way to form a tessellation, and it's that way. You can't form a tessellation any other way. You have to do it that way. Anything else is not a tessellation, and the box will be bigger. If you keep the size of these seven hexagons fixed in dimension... And if you rearrange those hexagons in any way whatsoever, in any way except this one way, the box becomes bigger. It has to. I, I can show you. Let's see. Tinkercad. change the colors make this easier for you to see so if I even so much as rotate this one little bit you can see it no longer fits inside the box there's just no other way around that okay actually this is actually not a perfect tessellation I goofed up a little bit hang on I gotta rotate this 30 degrees. There we go. There's the tessellation. Okay. <laughs> I was 30 degrees off. Good thing I checked that. Okay. If you rotate this at all so that these faces aren't flat against you, you can actually see it is smaller. You, there's no other way to pack it. If, if I were to take one of these and rotate them so that they were not a tessellation with this, let me show you. I can't do that easily in here. What I can do is I can separate them, and if I rotate, if I take this one, I rotate it, you know, five degrees. Um, you see now it pushes closer to this one here. So I would have to rotate this one five degrees in order to keep the wall spacing the same. So if I even do that five degrees, you can see I'm already punching out of the box here. That's almost zero. You can't print that. Okay. And um, so if you were to try to rotate these so that they were like this. Against this box. Negative five. No, I guess that was the wrong way. Ten. There we go. So if you were to try to rotate them like that, well, now I have to push this box further out to, to get me spacing in between the two hexagons. And now it's punching out of the box. You see the problem? 
there's only one way to make the tessellation work. That's why it's called a tessellation. That's where the, the objects line up face to face. Let me get these all back. There we go. So here you can see I maintain even spacing with the proper tessellation. Uh, those are still separated. Let me get them back into one. Let me join them. There we go. So there's the seven hex tessellation. That they're claiming they own. <laughs> okay. Which is no different than Honda submitting this for trade dress approval to the USPTO and then telling every other manufacturer you can't make four door, four wheel hatchbacks. Elderwood Games took their hex box, boiled the core functional aspect of it to a line drawing, a seven hex tessellation inside of a hexagon, and said that no one else can use seven hexagons in a hexagon. <laughs> uh, I don't get it. Well, I do get it. They want a monopoly. They want to own the right to do that so they can stop anybody else from doing it. And then once they have that trade dress, they will go after anybody who makes something similarly nice. And they'll claim dilution. And here's the problem. Here's what should be scaring you. Patents are good for 17 years. Why'd they get denied a patent? Prior art. These already exist. And you can't own basic shapes. Well, trade dress would give them ownership of a basic shape. They would own the seven hexagon tessellation. Anybody here think that's okay? Anybody think they won't abuse that? Anybody here realize that trade dress does not expire? It lasts for as long as the company lasts. Forever. You can keep trade. If you can maintain, you know, um, you know, aggressively, you know, defend your trade dress, they could keep monopoly access to a seven hex tessellation for a hundred years. <laughs> That's not what trade dress is for. Trade dress is for this. It's for your trademarks and logos. Trade dress is for your your actual logos. So with you know the, it would be this. This would be trade dress, okay? Protecting their logo. That's trade dress. What they have here is not trade dress. What they have here is a disguised monopoly. They want monopoly. That's why they went for a patent first. <laughs> That's why they went for copyright first. <laughs> That's why they tried to, when they realized that they were trying to copyright a basic shape, and when they were trying to copyright something functional. Because <laughs> remember, they're not trying to trade dress the design, the distinctiveness, or the aesthetics of their box, which I fully admit are wonderful. They have a beautiful, aesthetic, distinctive box. But that's not what they want. They want to stop anybody else from making hexagon boxes, which is why they stripped their USPTO drawing of any design, aesthetics, or distinctiveness. They stripped it of all of that and just submitted eight hexagons. <laughs> because they want a monopoly. That's why they tried to hide it as a sculptural copyright. Well, that's not a sculptural copyright. That is an engineering drawing of eight hexagons. It is the very definition of pure function. They themselves stripped it of all design, aesthetic, and distinctiveness and boiled it down to pure function. And they're trying to say that the natural formation of a seven hexagon tessellation is artistic and distinctive. People think it's pleasing. Yes, they do think it's pleasing. I think the stellar furnace we call a star is pleasing to look at too. It doesn't change the fact that it's a ball of fusing plasma. <laughs> There's nothing distinctive about it. You didn't design it. You didn't create it. As you say, Elderwood, it's a honeycomb. <laughs> 
there you go I will post the link to the that file down below so you can print out why what, what is ultimately my original hex box that I made um, you would have to actually print this on like a, a CR 10 s4 if you wanted to print it at its original scale Remember, I made it big enough to put Matchbox. I made it this big. It was it was as big as a box of chocolates. You know, you know, you know the big box of chocolates you get. It was about that big, and um, the um, that was decided purely by the sizes of the pieces of wood we had. <laughs> the the little pieces of wood we had in the scrap pile happened to be that big, so that's how big the first box was. <laughs> I mean, uh, <coughs> what are you gonna do? I'll see you guys later.